Hey guys, welcome to week four of distance learning. Um, I'm using this time in the video as always to go over this week's assignments as well as to give any class announcements and then towards the end of it I'll be reading the next three chapters in our refugee book as well. Um, I want to say congratulations to everybody who did the work from last week. It was awesome to first of all get to read a little bit more about what you guys have been doing um, in your all of your free time. Um, so I'm going to continue giving that as a warm-up every week where you guys will just type me a little bit about what you've been up to so I can kind of see what y'all are doing um, besides classwork. I also um, really appreciate the effort that you guys put into your paragraphs. I'm really impressed that so many of you guys remembered how to do those text structures and that's all three of my classes y'all are doing amazing. So those of you that are doing the work, please keep it up. Um, I It makes me so happy to get to see that y'all are just continuing to do amazing. So thank you for that. Those of you who are not logging in and doing the work, um, some of you have already gotten parent phone calls and emails from me. It is super important, super, super important. I know things are weird, but we are looking at the work that you're doing to indicate to us what level that you are on right now. Um, so if you need an extension or you need extra help, I'm always here for that, but you really need to get it done. Um, and if you need any extra instructions or you want me to call home and get you on the phone and explain it to you in a different way, that's fine as well. I know a lot of you guys have been Zooming or FaceTiming with your friends to get help on work, which is also really cool. So I like that too. But I'm here for you, whatever you need. So this week you will have your little warm up and it's all going to be in one PowerPoint again. So you don't need to, or one Google site. So you will not need to worry about logging into um, multiple or clicking on multiple assignments. It's all in one place in your own copy of the project. When you click on it, all the directions will be right there. So you'll fill out one slide. I'm gonna ask you guys to find one image, either a clip art image from the internet, or maybe you'll upload an image, and I want you to use that image to tell me about your week. So maybe you spent the week with your dog. So you'll upload a picture of your dog and you'll give me five sentences about what you did. Or maybe you did a baking project with your grandmother. So you'll upload a picture of what you baked, or maybe um, you're not having access to photos. So you'll just find a photo and then you'll type about what you did. So that way it's kind of like what we did last week, but it has an image aspect as well, which should be kind of fun to see what you guys upload. And I'm okay with you guys doing memes too, if you want to. Um, after that, you guys are not really going to be doing a ton of new research. Uh, all you're going to be doing is taking the information that you learned last week about the natural disaster that you selected, and then you will be um, putting that into the project of your choice. So you will either be presenting that information in a wrap, a video, a poster, a brochure, you can create a quiz, um, you can just take a video or a recording of yourself reading your three paragraphs if you want to, but this is your opportunity this week to be a little creative and take the information that you learned last week in your research and um, put it into the, the medium of your choice this week. So I'm really excited to see what we get. We're working on a website in the ELA department where we can share some of your work because y'all are doing amazing stuff and it's not super cool that I don't get to share it with the rest of you guys. So be waiting for a link and I'll be um, able to upload some of your classmates work because it's really cool. Y'all are doing awesome stuff. Um, what else? I wanted to share a little bit about what I've been up to this week because you guys shared with me. So I wanted to share two books that I read this week. Um, I read this book that got made into a TV show. So some of you guys might have seen this show. It's called Good Omens by Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett, which was really funny. Um, it's kind of about the end of the world, but it's really funny. So um, if you guys want to read this, it's definitely appropriate for um, most of you guys. I think it's, a, it's about on our level and it's really funny. And then I also started this graphic novel called Watchmen. Some of you guys might have seen the, um, there's a movie made of it and there's a new TV show. So it's mostly in pictures, but it has some text. Um, so it's been pretty cool to read that and get into a graphic novel a little bit too. So that's been fun. Um, I really wanna hear what you guys have been up to, what you're reading. Um, if you're writing any fun stuff on your own, please keep telling me that, because it's really exciting to see how creative you guys can be. And that's why this week's project is creative as well. Um, I think that's it for me for announcements. Again, I'm so proud of you guys. I'm really impressed with how many of y'all are still doing the work, so please keep it up. And here's our novel. Joseph, somewhere on the Atlantic Ocean, 1939, 14 days from home. A day out from Cuba, the St. Louis threw a party. Streamers and balloons hung from the ceiling and decorated the gallery rails of the first class social hall. Chairs and tables were pushed aside to make room for dancers. 
There was a feeling of wild relief, as though they were dancing away all the stress of leaving Germany. The steward smiled with the passengers as though they understood, but none of them could really understand, Joseph thought. Not unless their shop windows had been smashed and their businesses had been shut down. Not until the newspapers and radio talked about them as subhuman monsters. Not until shadowy men had burst into their homes and smashed up their things and dragged away someone they loved. Not until they had been told to leave their homeland and never, ever come back. Still, Joseph enjoyed the party. He danced with his mother while Ruthie, Renata, and Evelyn ran in and out between people's legs all evening long. Joseph had been nervous about Cuba at first, scared of the unknown, but now he was excited to reach Havana to start a new life, especially if it was like this. Joseph's father stayed hidden away in their cabin the whole night, sure this was all just another Nazi trick. The next morning, breakfast in the ship's dining room was interrupted by the thundering, clanking sound of the anchors being dropped. Joseph ran to the window. Dawn had broken and Joseph could see the Malecon, Havana's famous seaside avenue. The stewards had told them all about its theaters and casinos and restaurants and the Miramar Hotel where the, all the waiters wore tuxedos, but the St. Louis was still a long way off from there. For some reason, the ship had anchored kilometers out from shore. It's for the medical quarantine, a doctor from Frankfurt explained to the small crowd who had gathered with Joseph at the porthole to look at Cuba. I saw them run up the yellow flag this morning before breakfast. We just have to be approved by the port's medical authorities first. It's standard procedure. Joseph made sure he was on deck when the first boat from the, from the Havana Port Authority reached the St. Louis. The Cuban man who climbed the ladder to sea deck from the launch was deeply tanned and wore a lightweight white, white suit. Joseph watched as Captain Schroeder and the ship's doctor met the man as he came aboard. The captain swore an oath that none of the passengers was insane, a criminal, or had a contagious disease. That was apparently all that should have been required because when the port doctor insisted he still be allowed to examine each and every passenger, Captain Schroeder looked angry. He bawled his fists and breathed deeply, but he didn't object. He gave a curt order to the ship's doctor to assemble the passengers in the social hall and then marched away. Joseph ran back to his cabin and burst in on his mother packing the last of their things. Ruthie was helping her while Papa lay on the bed. The, the doctor from Cuba, he's going to make all the passengers go through a medical examination, Joseph told his mother, still panting from his run. They're gathering everybody in the social hall right now. Mama's shocked look told him she understood. Papa was not well. What if the Cuban doctor said he was too mentally disturbed to be allowed into Havana? Where would they go if Cuba turned them away? What would they do? Gathering us, Papa said. He looked even more frightened by the prospect than Joseph's mother had. Like, like a roll call? He stood up and backed against the wall. No, he said. The things that happened at roll call, the hangings, the floggings, the drownings, the beatings. He wrapped his arms around himself, and Joseph knew his father was talking about that place, Dachau. Joseph and his mother stood like statues, afraid to break the spell. Once I saw another man shot dead with a rifle, his father whispered. He was standing right beside me. He was standing right beside me, and I couldn't move, couldn't make a sound, or I would be next. It's not going to be like that, dear heart, Mama said. She reached out to him, tentatively, gently, and he didn't flinch under her hand. You were strong once before in that place. We just need you to be strong again, and then we'll be in Cuba. We'll be safe forever, all of us. It was clear to Joseph that his father was still lost in his memories of Dachau as they led him to the social hall. Papa looked frightened, jittery. It scared Joseph when his father got this way, but he was even more scared that the doctor would see Papa's condition and turn them away. Joseph and his family joined the other passengers, standing in rows, and the doctor walked among them. Papa stood beside Joseph, and as the doctor got closer, Joseph's father began to make a low keening sound like a wounded dog. Papa was starting to attract the attention of the passengers around them. Joseph felt a bead of sweat roll down his back beneath his shirt, and Ruthie cried softly. Be strong, my love, Joseph heard his mother whisper to his father. Be strong like you were before. But I wasn't, Joseph's father blubbered. I wasn't strong. I was just lucky. It could have been me. Should have been me. The Cuban doctor was getting closer. Joseph had to do something, but what? His father was inconsolable. The things he said he saw, Joseph couldn't even imagine. His father had only survived by staying quiet, by not drawing attention to himself. But now he was going to get them sent away. Suddenly, Joseph saw what he had to do. He slapped his father across the face hard. Papa staggered in surprise and Joseph felt just as shocked as his father looked. Joseph couldn't believe what he'd just done. Six months ago, he would never have even dreamed of striking any adult, let alone his father. Papa would have punished him for such disrespect. But in the past six months, Joseph and his father had traded places. Papa was the one acting like a child, and Joseph was the adult. Mama and Ruthie stared at Joseph, stunned, but he ignored them and pulled his father back into line. Do you want the Nazis to catch you? Do you want them to send you back to that place? Joseph hissed at Papa. 
I, no, his father said, still dazed. That man there, Joseph whispered, pointing to the doctor. He's a Nazi in disguise. He decides who goes back to Dachau. He decides who lives and dies. If you're lucky, he won't choose you. But if you speak, if you move, if you make even the slightest sound, he will pull you out of line, send you back. Do you understand? Joseph's father nodded urgently. Beside him, Mama put up a hand to her mouth and wept, but she didn't say anything. Now clean yourself up quickly, Joseph told his father. Aaron Landau dropped his wife's hand, dragged his oversized coat sleeve across his face, and stood rigidly at attention, eyes forward, like a prisoner. The doctor came down their row, looking at each person in turn. When he got to Papa, Joseph held his breath. The doctor looked Joseph's father up and down, then moved on. Joseph sagged with relief. They'd made it. His father had passed the doctor's inspection. Joseph closed his eyes and fought back tears of his own. He felt terrible for scaring his father like that, for making Papa's fears worse instead of better. And he felt terrible for taking his father's place as the man in the family. All Joseph's life, he had looked up to his father, idolized him. Now it was hard to see him as anything but a broken old man. But all that would change when they got off the ship and into Cuba. Then everything would go back to normal. They would find a way to fix his father. The Cuban doctor finished his rounds and nodded to the ship's doctor that he approved the passengers. Joseph's mother wrapped his father in a hug, and Joseph felt his heart lift. For the first time all afternoon, he felt hope. Well, that was a sham, said the man standing in line next to him. What do you mean, Joseph asked. That was no kind of medical inspection. The entire business was a charade, a giant waste of time. Joseph didn't understand. If it wasn't a proper medical inspection, what had it all been for? He understood when he and his family lined up at the ladder on sea deck to leave the ship. The Cuban doctor was gone, and he left Cuban police officers behind in his place. They were blocking the only way off the ship. We've passed our medicals and we have all the right papers, a woman passenger said to the police. When will we be allowed into Havana? Mañana, the policeman said in Spanish. Mañana. Joseph didn't speak Spanish. He didn't know what mañana meant. Tomorrow, one of the other passengers translated for them. Not today, tomorrow. Isabel, The Straits of Florida, somewhere north of Cuba, 1994, one day from home. Isabel hit the water and sank into the warm Gulf Stream. It was pitch black all around her and the ocean was alive. Not alive with fish, alive like the ocean was a living creature itself. It churned and roiled and roared with bubbles and foam. It beat at her, pushing her and pulling her like a cat playing with the mouse it was about to eat. Isabel fought her way back to the surface and gasped for air. Isabel, her mother shrieked, her arms stretching out for her. But there was no way her mother could reach her. The boat was already so far away. Isabel panicked. How is it so far away already? We have to get the boat turned, Isabel heard Louise cry. If we don't meet the waves head on, they'll roll us over. Dad, Yvonne yelled. Isabel spun in the water and a wave slammed into her, filling her mouth and nose with salty water and sweeping her under again. The wave passed and she broke the surface, gagging and choking, but she was already moving toward the place where she had seen Senor Castillo's head before it went under. Her hand struck something in the dark water and Isabel recoiled until she realized it was Senor Castillo. The sea was tossing him around, but he wasn't moving on his own, wasn't fighting to get back out of the water. Isabel took in as much air as she could and dove down beneath an oncoming wave. She found Senor Castillo's body in the dark, wrapped her arms around him, and kicked as hard as she could for the surface. The ocean fought her, sweeping her legs out from under her and spinning her all around, but Isabel kicked, kicked, kicked until her lungs were about to burst, and at last she exploded up into the cold air, gasping. There, there they are, Yvonne cried. Isabel couldn't even try to look for the boat. It was all she could do to keep Senor Castillo's lolling head above the water and catch quick breaths before the waves rolled over them both. But the waves seemed to be smaller now, still deadly, but not as high and fast. Isabel began to feel the rhythm of the sea, the sing solly lullaby of it, and it was easy to close her eyes, to stop kicking, to stop fighting. She was so tired, so very, very tired. And then Yvonne was there in the water with them, his arms around her like they were back in their village playing together in the waves on the beach. Here, here, they're here, Yvonne shouted. Their boat was now alongside her and her head thumped into the side of it as if a wave washed over her. Hands lifted Senor Castillo from her and soon they dragged her over the side too. She splashed back down into the half meter of water that filled the boat, but she was away from the waves, the never ending waves, and she collapsed into her mother's arms. Rudy, Rudy, oh God, Senor Castillo cried, clutching her husband's hand. Senor Castillo was unconscious. Luis and Poppy had laid him out on one of the benches, and Isabel's grandfather was pumping his stomach like an accordion. Seawater burbled up out of Senor Castillo's mouth, and he suddenly lurched, coughing and spluttering. Lido and Poppy and Luis rolled him over, and he retched up the rest of the ocean he'd swallowed. Rudy, Rudy, Senor Castillo said. She wrapped him in her arms and sobbed, and then everything was quiet and still, but for the gentle lapping of the sea inside the side of the boat and the sloshing of water inside it. The tanker had passed. 
Amara stood at the back of the boat, keeping the rudder straight against the waves, but the engine was dead again. Like everything else, it had been swamped. Senora Castillo reached for Isabel's hand and squeezed it. Thank you, Isabel. Isabel nodded, but it came out more like a shudder. She was freezing cold and soaked from head to toe, but at least she was back in her mother's arms. Mommy hugged her close and Isabel shivered. We need to get the water out of the bottom of the boat, Poppy said. It was strange to Isabel to hear her father talk about something so normal, so practical, when Senor Castillo had almost drowned and the boat had almost rolled over and sunk. But he was right. And get the engine running again, Ivan said. The water first, Lido agreed, and together they gathered up bottles and jugs and began the tedious work of filling them and pouring the seawater back into the ocean. Isabel stayed buried in her mother's arms, still exhausted, and no one made her get up. Where's the box with the medicine in it, Louise asked. There weren't too many places it could be in the small boat, and they quickly decided it must have fallen overboard in their confusion. Gone were their aspirin and bandages, and Senor Castillo was still dazed and weak. It was bad, but if they got the boat bailed out, and if they got the engine running, and if they got back on track with the sun tomorrow, and if they didn't run into any more tankers, they could make it to the States without needing the medicine or matches. If, if, if. They bailed water the rest of the night, taking turns dozing in the uncomfortable, crowded little boat. Isabel didn't even realize she'd fallen asleep until she jerked awake from a nightmare about a giant monster coming for her in the dark sea. She cried out, looking this way and that, but there was nothing but blue-black water and gray skies tinged with the red of the sun all around them for miles and miles and miles. She closed her eyes and took deep breaths, trying to calm down. The boat rocked again, and Amara struggled to keep the rudder steady. She had taken over as pilot while Senor Castillo recovered, but they still hadn't gotten the motor running again. The Gulf Stream would carry them north toward Florida, but they would need the engine to reach the shore. Isabel's mother leaned over the side of the boat and threw up into the sea. When she slid back down inside, she looked green. The boat was rocking so much now, Isabel couldn't sit on the bench without holding on. The waves were growing higher and higher. What is it, Yvonne said sleepily, another tanker? No, red sky at morning, sailors take warning, Lido said, looking up into the red tinged clouds. A storm is coming. Mahmoud, Izmir, Turkey, 2015, 11 days from home. God help us, that is what we're to ride in, Mahmoud's father said. The boat wasn't a boat, it was a raft, a black inflatable rubber dinghy with an outboard motor on the back. It looked like there was room for a dozen people in it, but 30 refugees waited to get on board. They all looked as tired as Mahmoud felt and wore different colored life jackets. They were mostly young men, but there were families too. Women with and without hijabs. Other children, some who looked to be about Mahmoud's age. One boy in a Barcelona, Barcelona soccer jersey didn't have a life jacket, but instead clung to a blow-up rubber inner tube. A few of the other refugees had backpacks and plastic bags full of clothes, but most of them, like Mahmoud's family, carried whatever they owned in their pockets. Let's go, let's go, one of the smugglers said. 250,000 Syrian pounds or 1,000 euros per person. Children pay full price, including babies, he told Mahmoud's father. There were two more Turks in tracksuits like the ones who had turned them away from the mall and they stood apart staring at the refugees like they were something disgusting that had just washed up on the beach. Their scowls made Mahmoud want to disappear again. Dad handed out their life jackets and they put them on. Mom stared out at the black dinghy bobbing in the gray-black gray Mediterranean seawater. She grabbed her husband's arm. What are we doing, Yusuf? Is this the right decision? We have to get to Europe, he said. What choice do we have? God will guide us. Mahmoud watched as his father pushed the cash they saved into the hands of one of the smugglers. Then Mahmoud and his family followed his dad to the dinghy and they climbed on board. Walid and his mother sat down in the bottom of the dinghy, his mother holding Hana tight in her arms. Mahmoud and his father sat on one of the inflated rubber edges, their backs to the sea. Mahmoud was already cold and the wind off the waves made him shiver. A big bearded man wearing a plaid shirt and a bulky blue life jacket sat down right next to Mahmoud, almost squeezing Mahmoud right off the edge. Mahmoud slid a little closer to his father, but the big man next to him just settled into the extra space. How long will we be on the boat, Mahmoud asked his dad. Just a few hours, I think. It was hard to tell on the phone. Mahmoud nodded. The phones and chargers were safely sealed in plastic bags in his parents' pockets just in case they got wet. Mahmoud knew because he'd been the one who dug through the trash for the resealable zipper bags. We don't have to get all the way to the Greek mainland, Dad said. Just the Greek island of Lesbos, about 100 kilometers away. Then we're officially in Europe, and we can take a ferry from there to Athens. When the smugglers had packed the dinghy full of refugees, they pushed it out to sea. None of the smugglers came with them. If the refugees were going to get to Lesbos, they were going to have to do it themselves. Does anyone know if dinner is served on this cruise? Mahmoud's father asked, and there were a few nervous laughs. The outboard motor roared to life, and the refugees cheered and cried. Dad hugged Mahmoud, then reached down to hug Mom, Walid, and Hana. They were finally doing it. They were finally leaving Turkey for Europe. Mahmoud looked around in wonder. None of this seemed real. He had begun to feel like they were never going to leave. 
Mahmoud had been so tired he could barely keep his eyes open before, but now the thrum of the motor and the chop of the boat as it hit wave after wave flooded him with adrenaline and he couldn't have slept if he'd wanted to. The lights of Izmir dwindled to glittering dots behind them and soon they were out in the dark, rough waters of the Mediterranean. Phone screens glowed in the darkness, passengers checking to see if they could tell where they were. The roar of the engine and the whip-blinding sea spray made it impossible to have any kind of conversation, so Mahmoud looked around at the other passengers instead. Most of them kept their heads down and eyes closed, either muttering prayers or trying not to get sick, or both. The dinghy began to toss, not just front to back, but side to side in a sort of rolling motion, and Mahmoud felt the bile rise in the back of his throat. On the other side of the dinghy, a man shifted quickly to vomit over the side. Watch out for the Coast Guard, the big man next to Mahmoud shouted over the noise. Turks will take us back to Turkey, but Greeks will take us to Lesbos. Mahmoud didn't know how anybody could see anything in the dark, cloud-covered night, but it helped his seasickness to look outside instead of inside the boat. It didn't help his growing sense of panic, though. He couldn't see land anymore, just stormy gray waves that were getting taller and narrower, like they were driving a boat through the spiky tent tops at the Killis refugee camp. More people leaned over the side to throw up, and Mahmoud felt his stomach churn. And then the rain began. It was a hard, cold rain that plastered Mahmoud's hair to his head and soaked him down to his socks. The rain began to collect in the bottom of the dinghy, and soon Mahmoud's mother and the others were sitting in centimeters of shifting water. Mahmoud's muscles began to ache from shivering and holding the same position for so long, and he wanted nothing more than to get off this boat. We should turn back, someone yelled. No, we can't go back. We can't afford to try again, Mahmoud's father yelled, and a chorus of voices agreed with him. They pushed on through driving rain and roiling seas for what felt like an eternity. It might have been 10 hours or 10 minutes. Mahmoud didn't know. All he knew was that he wanted it to end and end now. This was worse than Aleppo. Worse than bombs falling and shoulder soldiers shooting and drones buzzing overhead. In Aleppo, at least he could run, hide. Here, he was at the mercy of nature, an invisible brown speck in an invisible black rubber dinghy in the middle of a great black sea. If it wanted to, the ocean could open its mouth and swallow him, and no one in the whole world would ever know he was gone. And then that's exactly what it did. I see rocks, someone at the front of the dinghy yelled, and then there was a loud boom, like a bomb exploding, and Mahmoud went tumbling into the sea.